Hey, Cut the Shit listeners. You can find every episode on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Go check us out. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to Cut the Shit, a podcast series that aims to take a closer look at the impact of the IT industry, both the good and the bad. Cut the Shit is brought to you by Plow Networks, a managed IT services company based just outside Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Brian Link, COO here at Plow, and I'll be your host for this series. I'll ask questions, and with the help of our guests, try to dig deep on some of the key challenges we all face dealing with IT. So with that, let's cut the shit and get started. On today's episode, I'm very excited to have Tammy McCoy and James Terry from IndeedFlex as our guests. Tammy and James lead the sales and business development efforts for IndeedFlex in the U.S. market. IndeedFlex is a new platform built to reinvent the way companies and talent find each other, which is cooler and more innovative than it sounds. It began as a startup in the UK, and now Indeed has brought it to the US. We spent some time talking about IndeedFlex, the problems it's trying to solve, and how recruiting and staffing are changing in the world of remote and flexible work. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Tammy McCoy and James Terry. Tammy, James, welcome to Cut the Shit. How are you guys today? Great, thank you. Wonderful, thanks for having us. Why don't you guys give us, Tammy, why don't you start, give us a quick thumbnail sketch, kind of on your background, kind of how you got to where you are from your role today. Yeah, it's interesting. I just celebrated 28 years with Staff Mark on Monday. Did you realize that? Congratulations. <laughs> Thank That's you. a unicorn being the same company that long. It just I doesn't know. happen hardly anymore. It's definitely been a fun ride for sure. I started out literally entering applications into our system 28 years ago. And um, just from there grew to managing one of our, what we call on-sites, where we have 75 plus uh, temporary employees at one customer. Um, I was there for a couple of years and then promoted to um, director of on sites where I was managing $35 million <laughs> book of business. So that was fun. Um, there were, um, you know, covering multiple states with that. Um, one of our largest customers that I really learned from in Nashville was Assurian, if you're familiar yep. with them. Like I worked with them and helped manage their account for over 10 years. Um, and then one day, uh, my boss come up and was like, hey, I think you'd be great in sales. And I'm like, no way, not doing <laughs> it. I'm an operations person. That's not going to work for me. Um, but she was like, no, I think you'd be really good at it. You understand the operations side. So just give it a shot. And I was like, okay, I'll do that. Um, and unfortunately, I uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer uh, right before she asked me to do that. So took a year, got through the breast cancer, still here, 11 year survivor, and uh, come back and s got into sales. And I wish I would have done it 20 years ago. I mean, I really enjoyed it. I enjoy helping customers and I do understand the backside right. of uh, the operational side. So I know what we can do for our customers. And then three years ago, I was approached by Barbara Simmer, who was my boss at the time and said, hey, we're gonna partner with our sister company, Indeed, and we're gonna launch this technology, Indeed Flex, and we're bringing it over to the US from the UK, and I want you to help me sell it. And I was like, ah, no. <laughs> <laughs> so again, it's like, ah, oh, you know, change is good, right. but sure. you know, I, it's, we're into the third year, and it's been a great collaboration between Staff Mark and Indeed Flex, and we just continue to grow, and we're changing the way that people get jobs and very excited about, you know, where it's gonna go in the next couple of years. We've grown a lot in three years. There's been some pain, but we've made it through and uh, just excited about, you know, what's next. Good deal. Well, James, how about you? Thanks. So I started my career in sales, pretty much a career salesperson up until relatively recently uh, with an HR tech company. Uh, moved around the U.S. for quite a while and uh, led uh, large inside sales, primarily teams, um, really helping our organization drive efficiencies and allow them to be able to have kind of a scaled service model to be able to deliver to our customers effectively. I was given the opportunity when we did that in the U.S. to move over to Romania and so lived in Romania for a couple of years to be able to help them uh, grow an inside sales function there. Uh, upon the time of kind of my assignment ending, I was looking around at other opportunities and was approached by Indeed for this role at Indeed Flex, where Indeed Flex had just been acquired a, a couple months later by Indeed. Uh, they were actually called SIFT at the time. Okay. And uh, we, I was given the opportunity to lead the sales team for Indeed Flex. 
So after they were purchased by Indeed, it was all about growth and being able to scale the organization and, and to Tammy's point, change the way that people find jobs. So did that for a few years and then in... Uh, and that in, was, were you still in Europe at the time? That was, yeah, out of London, out of okay. London I lived. Is that where SIFT started? That was where SIFT started. <laughs> okay. uh, and we had these huge plans. I started on February 8th, I believe, of 2020. Excited to move to London. <laughs> and then everyone knows what happened yeah. after that. We were locked down. I spent most of my time in London actually under lockdown. And, and Indeed Flex, actually, the way that they grew in the UK market was in the hospitality sector. Okay. Uh, when, when you have, <laughs> right, you can see where this is going. <laughs> yeah. When you have a lot of, uh, a lot of hospitality tends to be more ad hoc assignments. Right. Uh, we need a bartender. We need kind of 50 bartenders. Kind made for, for a flex work. Kind exactly. Of right. Yeah. And for, and for really a gig app where yep. you, can, you can quickly access workers. Uh, we decided to move over to the U.S. as well, and during the pandemic, had to switch or, and, and, and pivot very quickly into light industrial. So we're actually really excited that during 2020, uh, between 2019 and 2020, we actually had flat revenue. So despite the fact that we lost 98% of our business, we were able to go and commercialize to other organizations right. and sell the value proposition. Did a one-for-one -one swap almost. It, pretty much. <laughs> so we moved yeah. to the U.S. and started to partner with Staffmark, and, and their wheelhouse tends to be more light industrial staffing. And uh, so we've, we've worked with them, partnered with them. We've grown a lot organically, but then also looked at really key clients and locations where we'd be able to build a marketplace of workers and clients through Indeed Flex to be able to... to to allow them to quickly access labor. Uh, and I think that our technology really enables that through our marketplace. About five, six months ago, I moved over into a new role. So instead of leading the sales team, I'm chief of staff for Indeed Flex. So really kind of helping to make sure that between the accounts that Tammy sells, the implementation of them, the delivery of the workers, right? It's, it's about supply and demand in this right. industry. It's, do we have the demand of the clients and the supply? And when you have an app, it actually needs, you have to have very good equilibrium of supply and demand because you have too many clients and not enough workers, you've got unhappy clients. You have too many workers and not enough clients, you're going to churn those workers right, very quickly. Right, because they're going to leave, right, because they, don't yep. get in, they can't make enough money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've, we've got a little bit of the background on, on Indeed Flex kind of coming from SIFT, but, but piecing that together. Give us the elevator pitch for Indeed Flex and kind of what, what, what it is and tell us what it is and why it matters. Relative to what else, you know, I mean, there's lots of ways to find jobs, right? And most people listening to this are probably thinking, well, there's already a bunch of job boards. What, what, what's, what's the deal? What is this thing? So In fact, I'll, everybody already knows what Indeed is. So, yep. you know, so with that is a jumping off point. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you maybe like the right now and then the long-term vision. Perfect. So the right now is, is really trying to remove the friction in people getting jobs. Uh, it takes, uh, on average for just about any role, at least two, three, four weeks to be able to get a job. Okay, and that's, you're talking like, that's at the, that's at the kind of the simplest, sort of lowest level, right? That's, a, that's not where there's, not even talking about getting into a more complicated cor search cor process. Correct, right? correct. That's as, that's as good as it's gonna get. That, that's about as good as it's gonna get. Uh, and, and ultimately, our goal is if we can remove friction, will you do that by leveraging technology and data to be able to allow people to get work faster? And our idea is really to give control and choice both to the job seeker and to the client. So if you think about actually the way that Indeed Flex was founded, one of our co-founders, he was in university in the UK and he got a, a job with a temp staffing agency doing bartending. And they would always send him out, he, it was in Wales in the UK, they'd always send him out like way to these beautiful castles, like think about Downton Abbey, yeah. rolling fields and these castles, right? So on and so forth. And you'd go out there and they'd do bartending gigs every weekend. And uh, he had a car. And so then they would call him and say, hey, are you able to actually go and pick a couple of, of the other bartenders up and drive them out there? He'd say, sure, no problem. Well, he ended up liking the job and, and being pretty consistent at it. Referred one of his roommates to work for this same, same temp staffing agency. This roommate didn't have a car and would always get calls on Thursday to go and work at the local pubs and bars. He said, hey, what's going on here? I don't, I don't get it. Like, why do I have to go and pick people up and drive 30 minutes outside of town, but this guy doesn't? And he realized that he didn't have the control or the choice in choosing which job and where and how and when he would work or for how much money. Right. He said, this isn't fair. We need to democratize and give, give a little bit of power back to the workforce itself. And so that's, that was kind of the genesis of Indeed Flex. So really picture a world where you can go on the app and choose what assignment you want to pick up. 
it different people are going to have different priorities. Maybe it's pay rate. Maybe it's location. I, I don't have access to public or to, to a car, so I need to take public transport. Maybe it's the hours because I have childcare. I have to take grandma to the doctor right. every Wednesday. And so this really, the idea is to, to give the workers control and choice. On the client side though, uh, as you have the data of which workers are showing up, which workers are doing well, we ask the clients to rate the workers. So we're able to build essentially a library of who are the best workers and then use our smart matching algorithm to be able to say, hey, this worker does a great job in this, in this role. So when a client posts a job, rather than it going out to everyone or just the last person to walk in the door, we're gonna prioritize the best workers to be able to drive success for the client. So that's a little bit of the ecosystem of, of how it sits right now. Long term, the idea is we wanna be able to remove the resume, completely get rid of the resume. Over 70% of candidates lie on their resume. <laughs> There's lots of incentives to do so. So, so right? I mean, yeah. I mean, there's only three of us here, but uh, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> Two of us. <laughs> That's what you're saying. Yeah. So, so long term, what we want to do is, is, and this is why the partnership with Indeed is really compelling, is because you can now have a, a, a business owner go online. Uh, this is, sorry, not right now, but, but medium the, term, this is go online yeah, where you go. and be able to say, okay, I'm going to post a role. And I can actually see people that have done this job. I can see the companies they've worked for and their star ratings. And this person's actually gotten a thumbs up for being a good communicator, or having really good customer service or more technical knowledge or whatever it might be. So the goal is, can we remove the resume and have it be a verified profile and a verified resume and also potentially remove the need, as I was talking about the friction before, to even do an interview. Right. Why do you need to do an interview if you've already worked for a competitor for three, six, nine months right. and you've done a great job with them? Right. Makes sense. It makes sense. So I hear what you're saying. It feels a little bit like a dating app or something like between uh, you know people who need jobs and people who need employees um, and a, a kind of a matchmaking service yep. with a lot of verification, right? That's maybe the maybe the differential because you, you could argue Indeed does that today, but it's in many ways the job board resume thing, right? Where you, you've, you guys have added some technology to try to sort and process that. But at the end of the day, that's still kind of what it is. Um, so this feels like the logical next step. What problem is Indeed Flex trying to solve relative to traditional recruiting and staffing? So let's kind of take it a little bit different direction and think about the way a traditional recruiting and staffing firm works today versus what we're describing or what, what James is describing. Yeah, so as he was talking, I was sitting here thinking like being in being with staff mark 25 years prior to knowing indeed flex and knowing what the technology right, so you know what that's do. you know what that world is that's, that's kind of what i'm interested to hear and i think yeah. it's very challenging for some of our customers to shift that mindset to oh i'm going to hire someone from a platform what does that look like what does that mean i need to interview them i need to see them i need right. to but as james was mentioning it's more about changing the way we hire like you have all of their verified they're all verified w2 workers um we verify um you know through i9 um and it it was almost like a change of mindset for me right because when you do something for so long it's like okay what can i do next like what what is the next best thing and honestly it's indeed flex because we take hiring from for for example our customers when they need employees to work for them they call one of our branch offices our branch office may or may not be open if it's after hours and they need someone to start the next day. Right. Um, if they're not open, then the branch may have to start recruiting um, if they don't have a pool of what that person's looking for. Versus if you have a need and have the Indeed Flex app, you go to the app, you put in how many workers you need, the algorithm that he was talking about automatically sends it out to everyone who's qualified for that position and they could start within hours. Right. That's the biggest difference and I think the biggest mindset is you don't have we still have the human touch because we have management around and we still have people who you know call our branches so it's not 100 percent technology sure. um, but on the other hand it's um it's just shifting the mindset of our customers like this can work for you right got it yeah if, if i could add to that so in the staffing industry right now uh only about 6.1% of candidates are placed for a second time with a staffing agency. So that means that 
over 90% of the time, once I get that first job with a staffing agency, I'm, I'm probably not going to work for another client with them. Right. No matter how good or not good I might be. Uh, in addition to that, you know, the first week turnover rate in more light industrial or, or commercial staffing, you're looking at 40 to 60%. So you've got all these people churning. And by the way, like when these people showed up for work their first day, they weren't only planning to work for one day. It's that they realized that, you know what, it's actually a cold environment and I don't want to be here. Or like I talked about, the commute isn't, isn't what I need or the schedule isn't what I thought it would be. That doesn't mean those are bad workers. It means that they just didn't find the right place. And, and so the way that, that st traditional staffing works right now, a lot of the times is you have a whiteboard on the wall in the staffing branch and I have all the clients and how many people we need for each client and a worker comes in and the way that they're placed is by the recruiter who says, well, which client gives us the highest margin? <laughs> right. Which client is the happiest or the most unhappy? Right. Who needs something real bad? They're yelling right. at us. Yeah. And, and that's the way <laughs> yeah. that I am selecting the worker and placing them. And so who's making the decision? Probably the least important person in this whole equation, not the worker and not the client. Right. And so I think that that's a really important component is that we want to be able to give choice to the workers to say, where do you want to work? And then it's, it, you know, we can work at speed and fill a shift in seconds and get someone there uh, th that night for a night shift or whatever it might be. But in addition to that, we can also scale up or scale down the amount of choice that a client has. So if a client says, you know what, I really want to offer this only to the people that have been here before so that I can have that consistency. They can do that. Hey, I really want to be able to actually see what has their experience been working with other clients or maybe before they started with Indeed Flex. And we can give them the ability to actually go through and filter. Hey, these are the top candidates. I actually want to customize and offer to these 10 people for this role. Right. So being able to give people that choice and essentially remove the middleman of the staffing agency. So really inserting the technology to just help funnel the right candidates to the right clients. Makes sense. It makes sense. It's interesting to me because I know you talked a little bit about, and we talked before the podcast about sort of the, the current market and kind of where you guys are, are where Indeed Flex is, is operating, right? Hospitality in the UK, obviously the pandi pandemic didn't help that. Doesn't mean you can't be bad yeah. because it's logical. It makes sense. I mean, that, that industry obviously has come back. So I'm assuming that's, you've spun that back up mm -hmm. um, to, to a good place now. But, but you've mentioned uh, hospitality and light industrial. What's curious to me is that this feels tailor-made for IT services, right? When you think about the nature of IT work, right? And the kinds of skills that are out there, both needed and difficult to find, that is very often project-based, very often you know, on-demand needs around, hey, look, we've got a client that's got a particular, you know, they've got an issue that we need 10 engineers on for a month. Well, uh, you know, the average, you know, managed services provider like us or other companies doesn't have 10 extra people that they can just go send to go work on this project, right? So that kind of a, that sort of an up and down feel and that smoothing impact that you're talking about with Indeed Flex feels like a natural fit. I'm just curious, has that something that you guys have thought about in terms of the roadmap? It, it is something we've thought about uh, and, and, it, and IT and more white collar work is definitely on the roadmap. Uh, the, the reason that we haven't quite jumped into it yet is because uh, one of the core components of what we do is building a marketplace. So when a client comes to us and says, hey, I need a bunch of people in Des Moines, Iowa, we'll actually tell them no. Right. And the reason for that is because we don't want people to, if we recruit a bunch of people and we send them in, hey, while most agencies have a 40 to 60% turnover rate, ours might be better but in the first week, but it's not going to be 2%. Right. And so those workers are gonna churn naturally, and then what else are they going to do? And so an important component for us is we have to have that critical mass yeah, of the right number of sure. clients to be able to support that so that- yeah, If you don't have the universe of jobs, you can't, I mean, and in many ways, it is a matching problem, right? But you, the job, without a job, you can probably find lots of potential yep. candidates, but without jobs, it, you're exactly. not really gonna get anywhere. Exactly, and, uh, and, and another important part of it is we're, we're continuing to build out the product to be able to serve those types of needs that are going to be more specific to white collar. So as an example, I need to be able to see a more specific, like more detailed resume. Um, I need to be able to schedule an interview f 
through the app to be able to have a vetting conversation right. because we understand like for some types of roles, we push back on clients and say, do you really need to do an interview? For others, it makes sense to sure. be able to find the right fit. And those are the types of things that we are building in the app and we really want to make sure we get it right before we jump into those other, other markets. Yeah, it's just, it's a huge problem in our industry, right? Is trying to match that need for uh, maybe excess or on demand or spike labor, mm -hmm. right? Which it sounds, I mean, in many ways, uh, if you've got the kind of turnover rate you're talking about, that's a problem every day in the light, in the light industrial space, right? Because of the turnover. Yep. Ours isn't necessarily based on turnover, but it's the same kind of it's the same kind of problem. A technology need comes up that's has a beginning and a middle and an end. It's not an ongoing service. So I was just curious how you guys were thinking about that. Um, let's maybe take one step up and talk a little bit about sort of the evolution of the employment landscape, particularly over the last four years. I mean, how much has the pandef pandemic really reshuffled the deck for you guys in terms of or, or what you're seeing in the marketplace around finding candidates, the geographical needs, you know, being, you know, what, what I would, would assume was much more local focused as opposed to now. I'm just curious what kind of impact that's had for you. And Tammy, maybe you take that. Yeah. From so I think locally, you know, currently our unemployment rates like 2.9%. So, um, fairly low. And I, I think about this often because I was with staff Mark in 2008, 2009 during the recession. So, um, I think the pandemic has impacted us more than what happened then. Um, people, more, uh, more candidates want to work from home. They want to be remote. Um, they don't want to go into an office, um, which, you know, for a year, we did that a year, year and a half. So I totally get that. Um, I think that's the biggest shift. And as you know, James is talking about with flex, people just want more control and choice. Yep. They want a better work life balance. So in some of our customers that are more light industrial and they need people to be there 40, 50 hours a week, it's just not appetizing to them. They're like, uh, you know, right. I can, I can find something else. I want a remote position. I want to spend more time with my family. We get that. And so I think with indeed flex and the technology, we're able to provide them that. Yeah, if I could, if I could piggyback on that, I, I would say that uh, about a year ago, I was given the opportunity to present at a, a, a warehousing association conference, and right before I went on stage, they had a roundtable with a number of warehouse directors and operations managers from from relatively large organizations. Uh, there was one from a beverage manufacturer who got up and said, "You know, we're so proud of how efficient we've made it. Did you know that you can actually get?" Uh, you can go online and get get your name or anyone's name or a slogan printed on this bottle and it'll get sent to you within a week. And then another lady stands up and she says, well, do you know what we've done that we're really proud of is it if you, if you order something online from us by 11 p.m. that day, we're going to get it to you the next day. And it, I had a light bulb moment at that point because I realized that what these organizations have driven is a huge amount of choice. They've, they're giving consumers choice in the way that they are engaging with their product and allowing them to customize it more and right. more. Well, those people that are buying the clothes or buying the bottles, those are also their workers. And you need to be able to understand that they're going to expect the same type of choice now in the way that they're working. How many times have you gotten to an Uber and someone says, you know what, I'm never going to take another job in my life because I can decide when I want to turn the app on or when I want to turn the app off. Right. And, and that's happening across the board. This younger generation tends to want to have more control. And so I think that's a huge component of, of why candidates are engaging with these types of apps because they can set their own schedule. Right. In addition to that, you know, when you look kind of more specifically at the pandemic and what's happened, uh, there was it was really hard to find workers for quite a long time. We've we've noticed a bit more of a leveling out of of that, but the one thing that has not changed is these workers' desire to be able to have more input into the way that they're working. Right. And so their desire. To yeah, I don't be think that genie's going back in the bottle, right? I mean, I have a 25 year old daughter, and she's taken a job recently where she now has to work on site five days a week, and she's just kind of, it's kind of blown her mind. She doesn't really, she just can't get her head around the idea that like, I have to go to the office five days a week, even if I don't have anything to do there. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember that's how all work was. Like it didn't really matter. The idea that you could do work somewhere else other than the office didn't exist. So yeah. it's, everybody has that perspective now, whether you're young or old, 
you know, having lived through the past four years, right? And, you know, once you get a taste, like, it's like you just talked about. I mean, you know, if you can order something at 11 o'clock and get it the next day, you're not willing to wait three days anymore. You're like, what the hell? That doesn't make any sense. Like, mm-hmm. why does it take so long? Even though there could be, a, maybe there's a good reason for it, but you don't, expe- you don't, you, you don't accept it anymore. Yeah, and, and, and whether it's working from home or working in the office or having to do a long interview process with vetting and, hey, you need to drive across town to prove you can bend down and touch your toes for a job where <laughs> is that really relevant? Like, the list goes on and on of yeah. the different requirements that people have. But what we talk to them about is like, have you, have you, do you really need this? Like for, for coming to the office, this is something that's top of mind for a lot of people is, hey, if you're gonna tell people to come back to the office as Apple has done, as Google has done, as companies have started to backtrack on a little bit sure. more, that's fair, but are they gonna be sitting in an empty office? Or are they gonna be able to actually have collaboration? Are the managers gonna sit and, and say, hey, we're gonna make sure that when you are in the office, we have a really, value added day plan so that right. you walk into it and you walk out of the office saying, oh, that was actually worthwhile doing because while there's value in like the water cooler conversations you can have, it's important to make sure that, that the manager is actually driving some type of- Yeah, or that program. you're, to your point, collaborating. I mean, we have that challenge here. I don't really want people to come to the office to just sit by themselves and do the same thing they could do at home because these are all smart people that be like, why the hell did I drive 45 minutes to the office to do what I just do when I'm at home? And all I did was get on Teams meetings with my colleagues who are elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Like, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. But if they come in and two or three of them work on a problem together, they sit in front of a whiteboard, solve a problem, they have a meeting with their manager, and they have some water cooler time, that feels like a good use of their time, De- right? Definitely. And, and, and not, not to go too far off topic here, but one of the things that I really, like, on the, on the return to office side, that, that I really think about a lot are younger people right out of college or just entering the workforce that are taking these remote jobs and not having that really valuable interaction with people, uh, being able to learn from the guy or gal who sits next to them, who's been doing the job for 10 years, like the ramp up and the onboarding and the induction and getting good at your job. Like it's a lot harder now building those connections. It's really hard. Uh, you know, looking at who's going to get the promotion. Is it the person that doesn't have those kind of more personal relationships with people uh, who hasn't had those water cooler conversations or is it the the person that sits on Zoom? And and so I think that uh, leaders need to be really cognizant of uh, how they're helping to drive a lot of the value of of coming into the office and make sure that is value added, but also make sure that like you're being thoughtful about like if you're going to allow remote work, that's fine. But what are you doing to make sure that you're getting the productivity out of the people that you are bringing on now? Yeah, that training and learning piece of it is super important. And, you know, it's hard to can't always pick up a blank stare, uh, you know, over a team's meeting. Yep. They may be having the blank stare when they're not on a meeting. Right. And they're sitting there at home, not really sure what to do um, and maybe not sure who to ask. So mentoring and, you know, connecting people in those situations. That's, that's, that's a challenge for all of us, I think. I want to transition a little bit to the what I'd call, well, I mean, the work from home is, a, is obviously a big issue, right, for certain types of workers. But if you're manufacturing, you're making something, or you, you're delivering in-person services, well, there's no opportunity to work from home. You know, if you're making something, you can't, you can't make it at home. You got to come to the, you got to come to the facility and do it, mm-hmm. right? What are you guys seeing there? Because well, what you're talking about to me sounds like a real paradigm shift for those industries in terms of right now they've got traditional shifts. They've got, they got a lot of structure. I think that's very based on the past, right? And now you've got this potential group of, or at least a potential group of, you know, larger group of potential employees who maybe want split shifts, who want to work shorter time frames or be more, I use the word on demand. I know if you're running a, a line at a manufacturing facility, you can't have, you can't have on demand all the time, mm-hmm. but like, what are people, how are people reacting to that potential reality that they might be facing as they go forward? Maybe start with I, you. I think you had a, the perfect example yesterday or last night that you told me about uh, between two of our customers where one customer only needs employees that work, you know, two to four hours in the morning. But then we have another customer who needs full time, second or third shift. And so two of our employees that started a position yesterday were actually they went to the first shift job 
and then were placed on a different. Um, so they doubled up. They doubled because they could, up because, because the coordination because schedules. they can, and right. maybe they need the extra money for right. whatever reason. So, I mean, to us, that's where it really tugs at the heartstrings when people actually do come in and want to work. You're like, okay, they have something going on, and we're helping them right. get, you know, whatever it is. Maybe it's a vacation. Maybe it's nothing, you know, strenuous. But it it's just um, that's what we want to do. Like we want to change lives one at a time, and. It's so rewarding when people do pick up the additional shifts or even just want to work, you know, 50 hours a week to have the extra money to maybe put their child through college or, you know, what have you. So I thought that was the perfect example of two of our employees yesterday that immediately had access to another job when they finished up the morning shift. Uh, Over 40 percent of uh, people making under $20 an hour who work 40 hours a week have a second job. And... At the same time, you talk to a lot of businesses out there and they say, well, I only want them working here. And, and that's just, I think it's, it's a little bit of a lack of understanding that like in reality, people need to be able to make ends meet. There's inflation, there's cost of living difficulties. And so people are going to go find another job. And so what we talk to clients about is what are the must haves for you and what are the nice to haves and by allowing a little bit of flexibility around that, are you able to get all of the benefits of the consistency that you want, but also not have any of the fall off of people leaving and the turnover? Right. Mm-hmm. And so we've had a, we had a, 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 a client once who had uh, split shifts, four on, four off, and they said, this is great because people get four days off a week, yeah. um, which sounds good, but then when you think about it, it's I work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then I work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then right, and like so on and so forth. And in reality, uh, workers gave us the feedback and said, I can't plan a schedule. Like, I can't do have any day right. in the course of a month that, that I'm I always know. having off. Right, that I know that I have off, right. Yeah. And, and so you go to the client and say, look, operationally, we, ma- we understand that it makes sense, but let's work with you to figure out what is the best way to be able to have the type of coverage and fill that you need right. with consistent workers, but just allow them to have more consistency to their schedule and it can be a bit of a sea change and it's definitely it's definitely an adjustment for customers to make but if they're willing to take that leap of faith it becomes a very easy conversation a month later because then you're saying look at how ma- look at how much your turnover rate has gone down look at how much more consistent your workers are look at how much better quality you're getting because you're getting people that are going that are, are are really investing in what you're doing But it's also like with the consistency of the workers, whether it's three days a week or five days a week, once they're trained and they continue to come back, it's also cost savings for the customer because you're not training and retraining from the turnover. That was one of the questions I wanted to ask you. Do you really, do do, do you feel like your clients have a good understanding of the cost of turnover? Because my my assumption is that people have always, and I include myself as being, you know, on that side of the equation, probably underestimated how expensive it is to have turnover because it's sort of hidden. It's a hidden cost. I mean, not always hidden cost, but a lot of it is hidden, right? It ends up being slack getting picked up by other people, yeah. stuff not getting done, you know, deadlines being, you know, taking longer to deliver services, et cetera. I just was curious what y'all's perspective is around your, your client base on that side. I would say overall, probably not a whole lot because they look at it and they say, okay, well, I'm paying the staffing company a certain margin and that's how much it costs me and this is expensive. But in reality, well, there's workers' comp insurance and there's taxes right. and so on and so forth. But then also there's how much does it cost when you have to take one of your supervisors off the line every Monday and retrain 20 people? And then also those people take three or four weeks to be able to become fully right. productive. And a lot of them are leaving after week two because you're not very flexible in the way that you work, in the way that you operate. And so I would say that no, they probably don't have a full understanding, but also I'd say that it, the industry as a whole, the staffing industry as a whole, we could do a better job of really documenting out what is the cost of a vacancy for you and the cost of turnover right. more proactively. Makes sense. That makes sense. And I guess in, in sort of the traditional staffing model, how have you guys dealt with that in the past? I mean, you know, naively speaking, I'm, I'm thinking, well, turnover might actually be beneficial to a staffing agency mm-hmm. if the turnover is not coming from people you place, right? right? Because obviously you place somebody and they leave, yeah. you got to put somebody else in their slot. But if they're running people off and they're paying you to get new folks, 
that actually isn't a bad model, yeah. right? Which is a misalignment of what the ultimate goal is, really, mm -hmm. you know, from at the end of the day. So I was just curious how you guys have dealt with that, you know, in the traditional Yeah, world. and in and, and traditional or with and you know, our indeed flex customers, I mean, we always, you know, we track our turnover. Um, on a weekly basis and share that with the customer. And when there's a trend that we see, you know, maybe they're leaving within the two weeks. Were they really prepared for what they were walking into? And as James mentioned earlier, with the recruiters placing them versus the employee choosing where they want to go, we've actually seen a reduction in turnover on the Indeed Flex side because the employee's choosing where they want to work. Right. They've, you know, they've that makes been a big notified. Right? Yeah, they've been notified by their preferences that they put in the app. Hey, I want to work 10 miles from my house. I want to make $18 an hour and I only want to work from 6 to 2. And I can only work Monday, Wednesday, Friday. <laughs> so, um, it it we see that shifting when they're able to choose, you know, where they want to go, when they want to work yeah. and how much they want to make. And then on a, going back to your original question from the traditional side, so when we're tracking the turnover, we're able to go back to our customers and collaborate with them. Hey, our turnover has spiked, you know, after 30 days. We need, really need to look at this. You know, is it a training issue? Is it a supervisor issue? Most of the people leaving, are they voluntary or involuntary? Is it because of their performance? What do we need to look at together to right. make sure that we get a handle on this? That makes sense. And, and, and another really important component, I, I'd say this is, whether you're IT or industrial or hospitality, I think it, it really, it's, it's not sector specific, but in organizations where you're gonna have peaks and troughs in the number of workers you're gonna need, that's a real, another really important component to think about because uh, while it might not necessarily be turnover, if I need to hire because we just got a, won a big project or need to implement something very quickly and we need to hire 20 people, that's great. But are those 20 net new people? Or are we able to re-engage people that were here a month or two or three or four ago? Right. So whether that's those 10 IT professionals you need to be able to ramp up really quickly, how great would it be if you could go to people that worked here nine months ago and be able to re-engage them? Right. Or for a 3PL or logistics company or, or warehouse when they're gonna go into their peak season, what if instead of getting 100 net new people, you could have 100 people that or maybe 75 of them sure. are people not just that have worked there before, but that have worked there before that you have actually given a five-star rating and said, hey, I really like these people. These are great. Not only do you know they're going to be great workers, but the ramp-up time's not going to be sure. there. You're not going to have to take that supervisor off the floor. It's more them like a traditional full-time employee who's been with you for a while, right? You're trying to get the best of that it, sort of yeah. experiential component. It, it's really how can you create a bench? Like how can you create a bench of your best of, of the best people that you can pull on on demand to be able to come back? It's interesting because it is a market creation exercise. I can see that. That's a, this is one of those ones that's a challenge for a, for a startup. But if you can do it, you can you can own it. Yep, right? exactly. It's got, the, it's got those. It's got a winner. It's got a winner take all component to it for sure from that standpoint. Because that idea of a bench implies, well, they're on your bench, but they're also on the bench for maybe two or three other people, right? Because there, there's it, back to the peaks and valleys thing, right? It, it, exactly. And then and then for us, it's for the clients. You want to have them on the bench, but then for the workers. You also want to take those workers that are five star at those three or four clients and you want to give them the first opportunities. Of course. Right. right. So like you want to keep them busy all the time so that they're like, I don't want to go get a full time job because I have better than a full time job. I've exactly. got, you know, the idea of full time job is sort of passe in this model. If you, if you get there, take it to its logical conclusion. Right. Where it's like I'm basically working here and there and wherever. Right because I've got the skills and I've already vetted myself and I know I'm matching myself to when they need people. Yep, right? and, and so from, from a marketplace creation standpoint, you're, you're right on in that it's a balance between, hey, if you're gonna have someone who's, who's picking and packing boxes Monday through Friday, that's great. And then they can also go and, uh, they can also go and be a security guard at Nissan Stadium in the, in the, on the weekends. Um, but at the same time, those people that are picking and packing boxes, maybe they're not the best fit for right a bartender job. So, you, so it's about giving them the right opportunities. But there's like three or four subcategories of it's. It's also like, is this person also going to be have a transferable skill that they're they'll be able to do well in this other job that is going to provide the supplemental income that they're looking for? Right. 
Right. And I think in addition to that, it's about speed too. You know, as we alluded to, like yeah. if it takes four weeks for someone to get vetted and to start a new job, they're probably going to find a job before then, right? right. And so, and, and the other good point, fun fact is, you know, if one employee or one candidate is um, applied with one agency, the average is they've pretty much applied with five or six. Sure. So whoever gets them the job in first, best, right? exactly. Because yeah, yeah. they gets, assume that every agency has a different set of clients and jobs that they're covering, which is wrong. <laughs> that's correct. You know. That's correct. So whoever gets them to work faster is where they're going to go. Right. Yeah. Like a, a thousand percent. Uh, according to Bamboo HR, 23% of candidates, and this is not just for commercial staffing, but any uh, white collar, will 23% uh, of candidates will pull out of an interview process if they had, have not heard back in a week. And so the speed to, let's call it lead, if you're a recruiter, is super critical. And right. being able to get people booked into those jobs is important, not just so that you can have bodies fill seats, but think about it, those 23% of people someone is realizing that they're the diamond. Right. And so it's not just that you're, you're pulling losing... out because they got another opportunity. Exactly. Absolutely. It's not just that you're losing 23%. You're losing the best 23% of candidates if you're not really quick about it. And so within our system, what we do is we allow for instant interviews. So you download the app, you register, you upload as much information. Then it says, hey, do you want to do your interview right now? Click a button. And then all of a sudden you're, you're Zoom videoing with a recruiter who's going to talk to you and ask you the questions. Right. And, take you through the rest of the process, give them a conditional job offer. Hey, if you complete this last one or two steps, you're gonna be working here tonight or tomorrow, whatever it might be. Because you know, two in the hand is better than one in the bush. And so we're really trying to help almost gamify the system so that workers can kind of see, okay, like I'm almost there, I almost have that opportunity. Right. And let's be honest, do you really want an employee who's been sitting around waiting on you to call for six weeks and hasn't been out pursuing another position, right? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, they're, 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 they don't have a lot going on. Exactly. Right? <laughs> um, a couple more questions and we'll, we'll let you guys get out of here. Um, when, in conversations with clients, what are they worrying about most when it comes to finding talent? And, and are they worrying about the right things in, in, in y'all's perspective? They're, they're worried, I'd say, mostly about uh, how many people they have, do they have enough people? Like they need to keep the lights on, right? They need to deliver to the project that they have, uh, are, are, do they have people and do they have the right people and uh, is their turnover rate relatively low? Um, I'd say that some of the things that we challenge them on, historically in staffing, what it's been is you need to increase your pay rate. Higher pay rate means more money for the worker. I kind of think, and I hate to say this, but I kind of think that that's a lazy answer for a staffing company. It's like because the inverse then, of the real estate agent whose first answer is always, we well, should cut your price. Bingo, right? <laughs> bingo, exactly. And, and, and so, but in reality, so as we're building this marketplace here, the more requirements that a client has, drive across town to bend down and touch your toes. I need to be able to see a PDF resume. Um, I, I need to do an in-person interview. They need to go and sign an NDA in person as opposed to filling it out online and docu-signing it. All of those things end up adding friction to the process and slowing down the process. And so you end up losing candidates as we were just talking about. And so one of the really important things is you have to have the conversation say, and, and, and really businesses that are hiring need to, need to stop and really think like, what are the need to haves and what are the nice to haves? Right. Because if it's a nice to have just to prove that someone can do A, B, or C, then maybe maybe if you're in a situation where you can't find enough people like maybe that's that can become a nice to have as opposed to a right. need to have uh, and I think that's that's something that is a difficult discussion to have but once they start to move in that direction it becomes very clear because for us at Indeed Flex the more people we can have in the pool that you can access sure. the better yeah. if I've got 20 workers and uh, 19 of them have worked at a bunch of different customers and have a five-star rating, and only one of them has done this one little kind of component that you ac absolutely require, I can't guarantee the quality, right? Like if, but if you're gonna let me select what are the really important, like who, are, who do we think are gonna be the best workers based on the algorithm of the consistency, the quality, so on and so forth, yeah. we're gonna have better success uh, ratio. 
makes sense. So I think it's a little bit of, you know, as I mentioned early on, a little bit of a change of a mindset to, you know, we've always done it this way with a traditional staffing agency. Right. Um, I really, I really don't trust the process of trying something new. I just want Tammy because I know she's gonna. I know she'll give me yes, good people. That's right. Kind of a thing. I've worked with her forever. Right. Um, but um, you know, when we we talk about this a lot, like technology, it's it's happening. Like it's it's going to be the way people get jobs. So we have to stay focused on it, and we have to can continue to drive it to our customers. Um, you know, we we kid and talk about you know Airbnb. Who knew? Like you know, a decade ago that we wouldn't stay at a hotel, we would stay in a stranger's house. Like, and you know, as he talked about Uber, you know, we get in a stranger's car every day instead of a taxi. Like right. it, it's just changing the mindset of this could really work for you. Right. And you know, let's just try it, yeah. try it for 90 days. See if you love it. Yeah. And, and I think another, in my opinion, the, the company, whether it's in flex, hopefully, or another one of the organizations out there that's going to win, like win this, digital staffing uh, race because there's no doubt like the industry is going in this direction like this is going to happen in the next five to ten years but the company that's going to win is going to be the one that not only can create the marketplace and do all these things we've talked about but can also balance between the technology and the people because we do not provide labor we provide a service of people that are going to do a job for you. And that is always and should always be a human Correct. included or driven yeah. process. And so it'd be naive to say, hey, like we're gonna start up our operations and not have anyone on the ground and not have anyone working with clients. Like it's really important. Like you need to have people that can help to build the relationships and bridge that gap. And at the same time, you should also be able to be thoughtful about what are you using people for? So do you need to have someone who is actually doing a live interview every single time? Or can you have AI do that? Can you have AI have an interview and be able to score candidates? And then you don't get rid of recruiters. You take those people and now they're career coaches. Right. And now they're helping to move those 90% of candidates that aren't getting replaced and they're helping to move them over to good other clients that are gonna help these people earn money. And so it's, it's about using technology to enable a better process and more efficiency in the way that people are working and people are finding talent. Right, makes sense, makes sense. So I think you probably shift your hand on this next question, but I'll let, uh, I'll, I'll let you guys go with it. Um, as you can look ahead, kind of what excites you the most as you think about the next three years? Is this me or you? It's you. Okay. Uh, no, you're gonna I, have, I have a lot of excitement. Too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think what excites me the most is I think that we're gonna reach a tipping point. I think we're gonna reach a tipping point where staffing becomes more ubiquitous with technology as an enabler. Right now, to, to Tammy's point, you, you know, you go into clients and you're having, to, you know, they compare you to Uber and we're not Uber because you can choose your candidate and right. the candidates can choose the company yeah. you know and it's, it's not like a one time yeah, if they compare you to uber you say okay that means i'm just going to pick for you and they go wait whoa well, wait a minute exactly <laughs> yeah. and so and so being able to go into clients and and really help them understand the value of, of what they're getting that's what really excites me because uh i think that there's so much opportunity and there's so much low-hanging fruit when you have companies that are willing to go on a journey with you and that are willing to say, hey, I'm gonna trust that you're gonna do things the right way and balance the technology and balance the people. I think that's what's really exciting. I think the other really exciting part about it is being able to allow workers to transition and move to jobs they never thought they could have had before. Yeah. Uh, being able to allow clients to say, hey, you know what, this person came in as a picker or packer and they were really driven and now they're a forklift driver. and now they're a manager or shift supervisor and they get upskilled through our app on that and then when another client comes along they're able to see wow this per this is a really valuable candidate like that's the type of feedback loop that doesn't exist anywhere else right. from a verified standpoint yeah i was gonna say uh, it's anecdotal right or, or it lives in somebody's brain yep right? but exactly it's not it's not institutionalized in that sense yeah i am most excited to be a part of the journey um, you know, having so many years of experience in traditional staffing and able to 
um, bring the technology piece into this. And we have some pretty aggressive goals at Indeed Flex. We want to be the top employer in the world at, by 2030. So I'm just, I'm thrilled to be a part of that. And um, i very confident that we're going to be able to do it. It's going to be a lot of work, a lot of work, but uh, I just feel confident like it's going to happen because this is the way the industry is going. And I, I do feel like we have a step up uh, with some of our competitors just because of where we are today. Gotcha. On the flip side, what scares you as you think about the next three years? Hmm. I, I, I think what, what scares me is what's going to happen in the economy and, uh, you know, we've seen, as I mentioned before, inflation's been a big issue. Uh, I think that the, the prospectus of the economy over the next couple of years is is really going to drive the labor market. I mean, a part of the reason that we're having so many opportunities to have these really challenging conversations with clients about changing the way they're doing things is because they're still reeling from a year of not being able to find anyone. And right. they're saying, okay, I get it now. Yeah, they're open to, they're open to options because right? they don't have a choice. <laughs> exactly. And so yeah. you, you see it, you know, it seems like we're going to have a, a soft landing from all the work that Jerome Powell's been doing in the federal reserve. But you know, if, 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 God forbid we run into a recession, then all of a sudden it's, you know, it's, it's all hands on deck. And I really, I really worry that I don't want the pendulum to switch in the other direction of uh, staffing becoming more of a procurement dread, uh, driven conversation where it's, okay, it's about cost and dollars and cents. And rather than the HR side, which is about the quality and the retention right. part of it, uh, that, that's one of the things that really concerns me. I would have to agree with that, just the economy in general. I mean, we saw what COVID did to us yeah. during the pandemic. So, um, yeah, I think okay. hopefully, yeah. hopefully we'll avoid that. And, and it's funny because uh, I, I always, you know, I'm, I'm not an economist at all, but I, I always listen anecdotally to what's happening. And, you know, being so close to a lot of very large organizations that are doing warehousing, doing production, you know, building the plastic molds that go into the cars that you're buying, hearing what's happening with them uh, in the economy, like it, it's every week it changes. You'll have customers, and we have them in, in Nashville, where they say, I need a hundred people. And we go and we recruit and we're driving this marketplace activity. And then all of a sudden they call us a week later and they're like, actually, no, we don't need anyone because we just lost this order. Uh, and, and that happened, that's happening so much. And just this uncertainty, I think, is really concerning. Uh, one of, w w someone once told me, like, the worst thing that can happen in an economy is uncertainty. Sure. And I think we're in a position or a period of that right now. And with some of the global uncertainty that we're having, like, it, that, that's what I think we need to be very cautious about. Um, but also make sure that for those business leaders that are out there that we're not making any rash decisions because there is a knock-on effect of what happens down the supply chain. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, well, before we wrap up, I always like to ask something personal. Uh, and that, that's not personal like you might think, but, you know, uh, so I'm going to ask each one of you to maybe share something you've watched or read lately that you think others ought to check out. Um. I'll have to think about that. I don't watch a lot of TV. So. I will go with a book that I read recently uh, called The Culture Code. Uh, we have a book club at, at, uh, at Indeed Flex every, every month, and a couple of months ago is The Culture Code. And it was really interesting. It was talking about what drives good culture in an organization. Uh, one of the things that they were talking about was you know, being able to have like that intrinsic value and motivation to, to do a good job. It's not just about a bonus or incentive, but people being bought in yep. to like the value of what they're doing. And, and I think, I apologize, Brian, I'm going to bring it back to Indeed Flex here, but like, that's, that's kind that's of perfectly like, fine. It's, yeah. it's, it's really like it, it home mm -hmm. for me because it's really exciting knowing like our, our motto is we help people get jobs instantly. And I've never been able to work for a company where you can get out of bed every day and be like, I do something that's pretty freaking cool, right. helping people get jobs instantly. And, and us and the rest of our team, like the late nights and the early mornings and the blood, sweat and tears and all that, like you kind of know you're doing it for the right, the right reason. Right. And, and hey, even if you're leading an IT organization, like 
it doesn't matter what you're doing, but every organization drives value. And sometimes it is helping businesses operate more efficiently. And if you can help a business operate more efficiently, that means they can hire more people. If you help a business operate more efficiently, that means that they're going to provide a better service to their client. And that client is going to be able to do X, Y, and Z. And so I think like it's so important to don't think of it as a nine to five job. Think about it as what is the impact of what I'm doing? Like what the impact is going to be on society as a whole? Because like, you know, man is uh, man is uh, is is built to to be in a society or live in live in a in a society. I think that's like uh, John Locke or something. And we can't forget that we're you know we all are individuals, but we all are part of something bigger. And right. it doesn't matter if you're sweeping the streets or you're the president of the United States or a CEO of a big company or a mid-sized company or you're just in IT. Like we're all making an impact. I could use the same, like with um, our January book, Atomic Atomic Habits. I have not read that, and I am in the middle of it, and I just feel like I keep going back to change because this is change, right? Right. And so I think um, I would encourage everyone to read it to, you know, if you've been with the company for 28 years and you've done the same thing, (laughs) like, you know, look at your habits and see how you can better them and really adapt the change that is coming because if you sit idle, you're going to get left behind. For sure, for sure. All right. Well, Tammy, James, thank you guys for being on Cut the Shit. Really appreciate you guys taking time out. Um, And I hope you guys have a great day. Thanks for the time. Thanks for having us. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, we'd appreciate it if you would become a subscriber wherever you get your podcasts. And if you could rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, that would really help us out. Or you can just go old school and tell your friends, your family, your colleagues, and hell, anybody else who you think might want to hear something like this to listen in. If you're on social media, make sure to follow us on TikTok at Cut the Shit Pod, all one word, where we post lots of clips from the podcast. And last but not least, you can also watch the YouTube version of the show on our YouTube channel at Plow Networks. Until next time, take care and have a great day.